It is now flashing, so we are recording. So quick recap for the recording. You guys can all ignore this. We're getting started. I like PowerShell and DSC. And, <laughs> now, and, the, and the next thing uh, that we're going to get started with config management, and you might pilot things out. But guess what? You really need a pipeline. And you need to think about your pipeline for delivering that change because as you and then somebody else, whether it's at the same time as you, comes after you, they're going to, somebody else is going to need to be able to do the same thing. Or you're going to be able to need to replicate this behavior on another machine. Because we're going to get to in just a point or two, why, why, do, you need, why do you need that pipeline? Stability and consistency. The point, the, the whole reason that we are doing config management is to bring stability and sanity to, the, to our environments. Right? If, you, if that's not one of the major reasons why you're going to do config management, you're going you're to be doing a lot of extra work. And it's not going to provide you, it probably won't provide you necessarily the benefits that you expect. Does that, for those of you who are tackling you know, desired state configuration or Chef or Puppet or something like that in your environments, does that sound like a, a reason why you would want to be doing those, using those type of tools in your environment? For those of you who are here who aren't doing that, does that seem like a good reason for why you'd want to tackle a project like this? Right? You, want to, you want to bring some stability and sanity and some consistency to that environment and not necessarily, um, and, and not introduce unnecessary risk. Right? Because unnecessary risk is when things go down, we get paged, we have to go fix them. Usually it's at a time that's not the most opportune for us. You know, things rarely break at 9 a.m. On, on a Tuesday, at, right after I've gotten all my meetings done and I'm, I'm fresh and ready to focus on something, right? They, they break at, you know, Friday at 7 o'clock at night when I'm planning to go out to dinner. They break at 2 or 3 in the morning after I, I had a hard time putting my son to bed because he was not feeling well, you know? They break at very inopportune times. So we want to bring some stability and consistency to our environments. And so Sometimes you'll hear people say, oh, we need a pipeline so we can deliver change as fast as, as fast as Amazon and deliver thousands of changes and blah, blah. It is not about speed. Speed is a byproduct. The, and the, and it's, not, it's not speed of doing things. It's the capability to go fast. But it's really about control. And, and how do I control the changes that get into my environment? And if you can deliver change on demand, you can deliver it when you need it, consistently, safely, that is, you know, that is really the essence of this thing. And so one of the, one of the first real kind of anti-patterns or danger areas is you know, some of these things that we want to avoid. If we're pushing stuff off of our machine, We've already built a pattern of not, of not counting source control as the source of truth. The source of truth is whatever I've edited on my machine. It may be direct from source control, but it's not, it's not guaranteed to be. If I have a pipeline process that is driven off of changes to source control, or, or is driven off of a user interaction that refers to source control for its source of truth, as to what to do, then I have stability, consistency, tracking, auditing. But if I'm doing this off of my workstation, or I'm doing this in some kind of ad hoc fashion, I lose all that. And I lose all that because there's potentially magic values. I'm going to talk about these three things together. Magic people or magic machines. And what I mean by those things is, who here works on a stock VM image or a stock image and don't, doesn't customize it in any way, shape, or form? Anybody? All right. So you have made changes to a platform that you work off of. That has the potential to influence any command you run in your, your workstation in your environment, which can then in fact impact how the configs are generated. Because, you know, 
in PowerShell, for example, say I'm building a DSC configuration. I can stick PowerShell va variables in there. And when I run the configuration command, if I didn't properly scope that variable, it could just look up scope and find something in my environment that matches it. Because guess what? Naming things is hard. And we tend to reuse names for variables all over the place because guess what? Computer name is pretty represent representative of what we want to talk about. But may, maybe in my environment, I've defined a dollar computer name somewhere and I never passed that into my configuration. But now my configuration reaches out and references that particular variable. It could find it out of scope. That's dangerous. That introduces risk. So we want to control the environment in which we, in, in which we deliver our config management and our changes to systems. Sign of hands, that makes sense. Understand. Awesome. So when we talk about building a pipeline, one of the reasons that it works is I have to stand up this environment in some arbitrarily clean thing, and I can take a look at all of the things that are going to influence the creation of those configurations, or that are going to influence the processing of the things I need to do on those configurations. Then it's easier to take what I've done there, bring it local to my, my machine, and test things. It's a lot easier to grab a process that happens on a build server and replicate it locally than take something that happens locally and replicate it on a build server. Because again, we, have, we, have, we might have some of that environment magic Maybe I have some PowerShell helper functions that I, I frequently use without thinking. And I include those in my configuration. They run on some build server somewhere and they blow up because they don't have that function. They don't have that data available. All right. Anyone disagree? You're welcome to. You can have a perfectly valid point and disagree with me. That's cool. I don't mind. All right, the next thing we want to avoid is not having any tests. Now, I will tell you, you know, if you're going to go start building a pipeline, start with source, have something process them. It doesn't actually have to run tests, but eventually it should, because tests are the things that are going to enforce and ensure safety in our environments, and they're going to increase increase the robustness of the environments that we're building. So in a common parlance in Git, you know, I want to push some changes up to a repository. Well, if you don't have any tests, when you make your changes, it's push and pray. I'm pushing it, and I'm praying nothing goes wrong because my name's going to be on that commit message. And so it's going to come back to me. And by tests, I'm talking about unit tests to test your logic. I'm talking about functional tests to make sure that when I, when I run my MOF or when I generate my MOF document or when I'm building a chef recipe and I run chef spec, that the resource collections or the MOF document has the resources I expect to have it before we even get to the point of applying it to a machine. Then I want to have tests. Like, uh, was anybody here this morning in uh, Rob Schaefer's uh, in, uh, TDD, Pester, and uh, DSC and Chef talk hands? All right, awesome. Um, that workflow that he was talking about is a workflow that you want to have happen also on your build server. You want to be able to do it locally. You want to be able to happen on your build server because that's what's going to put the gates in place to protect your environment from things that are unexpected. So the last bit you know, uh, was that we do some integration testing, that we spin up a machine somewhere, or a container, or, uh, or go to some cloud instance, apply a config, and then use a tool that's not your configuration management tool to tell you that it actually did the right things. Do you know why we? Do you know why we would use a tool that's not our configuration management to tell us that it got it to the right state? We're not, why we shouldn't just blindly trust the configuration management tool when it says, you're compliant. And I will, yes? It 
It, it means you, you haven't been doing test-driven development. That's, that's, one, that's one option. So why shouldn't we trust the output of our configuration management client just yet? Pardon? Our input might have been bad. The, resource that is, the resources that are being applied to the machine might be wrong. There could be a test target resource that just says return true. Don't say you haven't seen it. It's, those are out there. So you want to make sure that, it do, that the config management does what it says it's going to do, and integration tests are what, what make that happen. So we want to, you know, if we have something that's configuring IIS, we want to go and make sure that the websites that we specified are there, that the right app pools are configured, that they're running under the right service accounts. Whatever, whatever the thing is that we're going out to configure, we want a secondary tool to go and test that. If I have a DSC resource that's creating SMB shares with the SMB share uh, commandlets, I want to use net share to, in my tests to validate that I'm seeing something else, or I want to use WMI, uh, you know, get WMI object, Win32 share, and make sure, that the, make sure that other tools are seeing the results of my changes. Sometimes you can't always do that. Sometimes we only have one tool that gets you into a particular, into a particular area, but you still want to exercise that tool outside the config management to make sure that the, the, the resources and things that you've done actually did the thing and aren't just lying to you coming back. This is one of the critical things when you use community resources and resources off public galleries, right? Just because something says I'm a high quality module doesn't necessarily mean it's a high quality module. I can slap anything on the box, right? You know, uh, th there's, no, there's no like FDA watching over and checking the ingredients to make sure that uh, you, know, you, have the, you have the right disclaimers on there. Right? So like in the chef ecosystem, we're talking about this a lot in supermarket. Like how do we build quality metrics for cookbooks? It's really, it's a really hard problem because they're so subjective. It's code. It can do a lot of things. And so if you're grabbing community resources, you're grabbing community cookbooks, you're grabbing community puppet modules, you need to be able to test those things before they hit your environment. Rob gave a really good illustration. He was doing some testing. We shipped a major version of a, new, of a cookbook that broke his stuff. Testing caught that. So he was able to then run things effectively because he was able to put in the right version constraint. Uh, yes? When do you run your tests? Always. Um, I run them locally as I'm building. So like I, I, I will run my unit tests that test my logic. So if I have a sufficiently complicated flow of work, like I, if I have to validate certain scenarios, like uh, say, in DSC this is really common because you want to validate that the system is in the, in the state that you expect. And for any non-trivial change, you're going to have some logic in there. You're going to have some if statements or some switch statements. And so I need to have pester tests that validate that given a certain input, I get the right output of, from my functions. And then, and you're controlling the inputs and the outputs, so it's a very scoped thing. And I run those all the time. In fact, I have a, mo uh, I have a, mo I have a, a PowerShell module. You cannot smash that word together. It just does not work. So I have a malware out there. No, PowerShell module out there called PowerShell Guard. And the whole idea behind it, it creates a file system watcher that you point at, your, at wherever you're working. And as you change files, it kicks off by default invoke pester. So it just constantly runs your tests. So every time you save a file, your tests are running. So as I'm working in my editor, I'll have a shell open either in our virtual desktop or on another screen that's running this, watching what's happening, and running the tests. And so as I make changes, I know if I broke something. Or, hey, maybe the test should break because I'm changing the functionality. So now I need to go change my test to make sure that it reflects the reality of the behavior I want. So then we get to integration tests. Those I'm going to run before I, you know, at, as, I, as I'm intermittently, as I'm developing, 
So maybe I maybe I change my function significantly enough. Now I'm ready. Uh, now I'm ready to apply that to another node and test it. So that might not be on every change, but it's going to be on every change set. So like if I have a if I make you know if I'm testing changing installing something from an MSI versus uninstalling it from a zip. Um, as I make that change in process, I'm going to apply my config and make sure that it works. And then I might rerun it to make sure that it doesn't update because it's already applied. Then I run it as a final step before I push up my pull request or make the merge to master. As I do that, my CI runs these tests. So we just talked about, hey, maybe I would change my unit test. Is that change to the unit test part of your commit that made it to source control? When, you're, when, you're, when your CI system, when your build system runs that, you'll find out. It also takes away, hey, maybe there's some magic environment or magic, ver magic environment variables, magic PowerShell functions, um, just some quirk of the registry matched up or the file system was right or the, feature, the right features were installed. When I run it on my, in my CI infrastructure, I take away a lot of those variables, right? And I, I'm going into kind of this known clean room environment to test things against. And so I have that double check or that, that extra sanity check. Um, in the reverse, we actually had the reverse case at Chef one time. Um, I was helping one of, a, one of my coworkers just trying to troubleshoot like, hey, I'm using the chocolatey package resource in Chef. And it works fine in our CI in, in at Vare. But when I run it in Vagrant on my local workstation, it breaks. I'm like, well, you have to install chocolatey first. The at Vare image has chocolatey there already. So we have a chocolatey package, but it doesn't do anything unless you have the chocolatey software. Right? And, and Windows doesn't yet ship chocolatey in it. So you need to, so you, you need to be aware of what, ha or, or, or what environment and the things you're testing these things in. You, know, you don't want to be in that push and pray scenario. Yes? So if you go to my screen sharing here, okay, uh, let's go, oh, did it drop me off the network again? Uh, let's try, yeah, okay. Let's try this again. Um, no, I want to go to, there we go. So if you go to stephenmorowski.com, there's this DevOps reading list. And on there, there's this uh, release pipeline model that Michael Green and I put together. It's a little white paper about all the concepts that you should think about with your, with your pipeline. And you'll find actually a lot of good ideas in some of these other books that are out here. Uh, specifically, um, if you're looking at uh, the practice of cloud systems administration is a, is, a, is a really good one around this concept. And uh, do I have the DevOps handbook in here? Or, uh, and continuous delivery is another good one. Those will both, both have some good ideas around pipelines and things. Um, there isn't a great, uh, and as far as like a DSC related reference infrastructure, uh, Michael, uh, not Michael, Mark Gray, I haven't seen him yet this week, but uh, he's done a virtual uh, or a lab uh, that they've done at Ignite and things about building a pipeline with 
with uh, DSC and Pester and including some integration testing and things. Um, I will take that though as some feedback to, for a, a good blog post. So, um, yes? So you write for every resource you write. Do you write one person check the resource or how would, how would you say how many is enough? How far do you go? Like, sometimes like, it's always like you write for everyone. Right. So a lot depends on your audience, right? If you're building a resource to share with the world, you kind of want to cover, you want to try to cover a little broader scenario. Now, you might also request some help from the community to do that, right? But then you want to make sure it's clear that, hey, this is the happy path I've tested, right? And let's, uh, and let's talk, about, talk about the rest of it. Um, this brings up an important idea in scope. Right. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about scope, uh, possibly uh, in a few minutes. But what, when you're building a DSC resource, resources are meant to be very low-level focused things. Because DSC has a composability problem, we, te we, we often see a lot of DSC resources that do a lot more things than they need to or than they should. And, uh, and so we end up having to have a broader surface of tests for that. So basically, every kind of logical operation that your DSC resource does, so for every parameter that it takes, you have some variability in the behavior. And so you, know, it, you need to have some level of testing for that. Or you want to that need to you want to have some level of testing for that. Now, is it realistic to, that you're going to you're going to provide every possible parameter value in every possible case to every possible resource that's going to be in your configuration? No, I mean that that's so you have to you want to target the highest risk things first, and and these things don't all have to be done very first thing, but they do need to get done over time. Um, and again, resources can change over time. So you start with, when I build a DSC resource, I don't, want to, I don't want to solve the world's problems in one resource. I want to solve my first immediate problem. And maybe I want to solve one part of that problem in a resource. And a, 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 an easy way to think about it is like if you think of, about some like the core module, core PowerShell modules, and you run like, get command and you do a, you pipe it to um, you pipe it to select object expand property noun sort unique each one of those nouns is probably a decent target for a DSC resource right you want they're low level you know now some of them aren't going to be like object uh, you know that's going to be a noun that's not not really applicable but like for the for the mod, for the things that configure system based stuff those are all poten good potential targets for dsc resources now again because of a uh, composability problem we tend to see things like in the x web administration module it's a really useful module but you see parameters that are like embedded sim instances and that's kind of a that's kind of a a code smell like that this resource is probably doing too much stuff that we have to, that we have to supply a parameter with, uh, with structured data. And uh, because resources, again, should be really low level, easy to express and model. Then your composability, you can bring these things together. Again, like I said, DSC's got a little rough story there, but So um, other questions on testing before we kind of move on. Does that, does that kind of help some? It, there's not a hard and fast rule, but it really depends on, on the use case, and you want to keep things as targeted as possible, but cover the, import, the, most, the most risky, important scenarios to you. All right, other questions on testing before we move on? Yes? Yes. Adding testing to that, right? Especially for people who aren't 
don't have development background and aren't, you know, that doesn't come natural to them, it feels like it slows it down even more. Do you have any suggestions or um, thoughts about, like, you know, what, what the other side of that looks like or, or how, how you can, you know, breach that chasm? Thank you. Yes. So, uh, for, for the recording, uh, the question was, uh, at, starting with desired, or starting with configuration management, you feel like you're going a little slower, st and adding testing makes you feel like you're going slower still, especially if you don't have a background that has been heavy on, uh, on, on code-based testing. Um, is that kind of a good short summary? Okay. Uh, yes, there, uh, it, you will be going slower as you start because you're learning something new. However, if you are not writing tests, you still are testing, but you're testing in your production environments where it is the most expensive and painful to do it. You're, you're, you're debugging. So uh, who liked the, some of the uh, lightning demos around the debugging stuff yesterday, right? Guess what? The more tests you write, the less debugging you have to do because you have a higher degree of certainty of the behavior of your software. And yes, configuration management is software. It's software that configures our systems. But you have a higher degree of confidence and understanding of how that software is behaving. So there's less unknown things to step through and figure out what's happening. One of the reasons we need really strong debugging tools is when we don't have that level of awareness of what's happening, right? So, not saying you, not saying that if you write a bunch of tests, you'll never debug again. But the amount of time you'll have to spend doing it is greatly reduced, and the visibility of when you're debugging in production, that's not bringing happy eyes on you from the rest of the organization, right? Because usually that means there's service impact somewhere. And, and that's, that doesn't look good for you, doesn't look good for your management, doesn't look good for IT ops in general. So you want to have, and, and you know, one of the reasons that we approach doing config management is to build that stability and consistency and robustness in our environments. So if, you, if you're a proponent of wanting to introduce testing in your organization, start tracking how long it takes you to find fix and restore service when you have issues related to, I've made a change to something in, in production, right? Then that gives, after, after tracking that for a little while, you can go back to your manager and say, hey, you know, if we start doing a little bit of validation ahead of time and maybe, maybe let me do a little pilot on this, I think we can bring these numbers down. And, and while I do this pilot, we're going to track related episodes to the thing that I'm managing and how much time we have to spend fighting fires around that versus what we're doing elsewhere. If you don't put, you know, if you're having trouble and pushback from management and the rest of the organization on this stuff, you need to fight back with things that matter to them. The fact that you're paged at night, they don't care for the most part, because they're not getting paged. It doesn't bother them. It's, well, that's your job. That's what you signed up for. I signed up to, to, to drink and guess and make marketing campaigns, right? And, sorry, the, the drinking and guessing thing comes from a Dilbert cartoon. It's one of my more favorite ones. Like, marketing, that's just drinking and guessing. It's actually a lot harder than that, and I'm glad I don't have that job. I, I like working with computers and technology, so apologies to the marketing folks. But, they, under, you know, they understand that their job isn't to get paged and woken up when, they're, when, the, when their email campaign can't go out because the mail server's down. That's our job. We get, we get woken up. So we, we start tracking that. We start putting this in terms that the business can understand. Man hours spent doing this versus, you know, if, I, if we spend, you know, 50, 50 hours over the course of a month troubleshooting stuff across people. That's a full week of work for somebody to have done something and done some better work or other work. So uh, fight back with things that matter to them. Hours invested, dollars lost, downtime. 
find out what's important to your manager or your manager's manager. And that can help you get the resources and time you need or give you the ammunition to start doing some of that stuff. All right, I'm gonna get moving along here. We've got a few other concepts to, to cross. Um, so we wanna talk a little bit about mindset. And this is one of the potential pitfalls here when we start talking about config management because we start thinking in terms of, of other services that we understand and have worked with before like, like group policy or that running a, running a deployment script. The idea or one of the central ideas behind a lot of the config management technologies is eventual consistency. That doesn't mean immediate consistency. You know, the focus here is on this eventual. It, this means when a DSC configuration applies or a chef, a, a chef recipe applies, I might not get to where I wanna be the first time through. Maybe there's a reboot needed. Maybe I installed prerequisite software and now I gotta come back around and try to do the thing again. Right? There are things that could prevent us from being able to, you know, if I'm issuing a like, start DSC configuration against, uh, against a server because I wanna configure WinRM, is that gonna go well? No, because, because WMI and the WinRM process are, are part of what's hosting PowerShell remote or part of what's hosting desired state configuration. So, you know, th there may be things that are, you know, as we're connecting out with that SIM instance. So, you know, there are potential, you know, there are things that aren't gonna happen right away. Almost all of the config management systems operate under this concept of test and repair. I test something and hey, guess what? It's in compliance, I can leave it alone. Hey, it's not in compliance, I need to do something. Sometimes, that may, may be, I have to install a feature, reboot, come back around to install, uh, come back around to, to finish the job. And it, it might be a multi-step process, but eventually I will get there. The other part of this is if you're using some kind of pull-based configuration. If you're using pull-based configuration, you're not out there watching the server, waiting for it to pull its config, and telling it, oh yeah, no, you gotta, you, you're up at 335, you're 340, you're 345. No, that's not how, that's not how it works. It's whatever their clock skew was, and, and when they initially pulled their config, and whatever timer they're on, and how long it takes to process their configs. So, you may, and you know, your web tier might update slightly differently. So the applications and thing, then your database layer. So the applications and things or the infrastructure that we're configuring needs to be okay with some variety in our environment. And very often our behaviors are, we upgrade things in lockstep. And there is, no there is no variability allowed that will cause problems. And so sometimes this means, hey, we can't do this method to deploy X application. It doesn't work well with that, with that particular method of doing things. Or, hey, we have a much more imperative process for deploying and configuring servers. I don't wanna wait for it to figure out it's okay. I wanna know and watch as this thing happens. There, there are arguments to be made on both sides of these patterns of workflow, but eventual consistency is a lot more hands-off and a lot more of a cloudy kind of pattern because you spin up a variety of nodes and you let them go do their thing. Eventually they will be fine and delivering services. Where in our data centers, we tend to be a little bit more explicit about that and, and need to have a little bit better handle on that. I talked about composition some already. You know, one of the specific challenges in the desired state configuration realm is composition. And by composition, I mean, if I, if I need to do something that requires a file resource and a service resource, I can't just but, uh, but I only need the service resource to do something if the file resource changes. I can't just do that with the existing resources. I have to rewrite the functionality I need into my own custom resource. 
I, the composability we have in DSC is composite resources. Those only have logic at the time we generate the MOF document. So if you're doing a poll-based model or an orchestrated push model, you have no runtime logic outside of a resource. The only way you'd get it is if you built the MOF document on the system that's being configured just before you apply it. So you'd need to build an agent to do the stuff, to, to build the configuration to submit it to the LCM. At that point, you're probably better off kind of looking just directly at you know, Chef and Puppet who can handle some of these scenarios. Then we have order of operations. Does order matter in the things you do? Yes. DSC by default does not guarantee ordering of operations. So as you build your configuration, if you do not use the depends on, you are not guaranteed to have any particular order honored for the resources. Now, very often they tend to be applied serially, but they've made no promise to maintain that behavior. So we gotta think about that as we're, what, what things depend on each other? What's the order that we have to, that we have to make sure that we uh, keep in mind? And that's just on one machine. What happens when we talk about order across machines? That's hard to do in config management. Oh, I guess I have a slide for that. <laughs> Another kind of mindset pitfall that we, can, that we can kind of bump into is the whole thing of, oh, I'm almost out of time, so we're gonna cover this one and then uh, we'll have a couple minutes for questions. Because this is really important. Um, and around silos versus sharing, right? When we start talking about config management, you know, initially a lot of organizations that, well, we manage the SQL servers, you can't touch that. Well, we manage the base OS and you can't touch that. And we manage IIS and you can't touch that. And that's all cool if you have your pipeline because your build server can accommodate all that kind of stuff, right? There are features in a lot of tools to allow those siloed behaviors to ship config separately right to their machine, <coughs> partial configuration, <coughs> um, which is a very, very bad idea because it, again, now we've removed some of the consistency and stability in our environment because we're not testing these things together. We're waiting until they collide on the machines in production to find out if we have problems. And it's a, it's a matter of we've just taken our silos and extended them into our config management on our machines. We can maintain some separation of, of duties and some role-based access control and things like that, but we have to build that into our pipeline and not into, our, not into the configuration management agent. So, I've got a few other slides. I will put this deck out on my blog later so that if you want to kind of take a look at some of those other ideas, you're more than welcome to. Um, but are there any questions before we call it a day? Or actually, until we call it a session, and then there's one more after us, I think. So I can't call it a day yet, but I can call it a day because I'm not talking anymore today. <laughs> any questions? All right, well, thank you all very much for your attention and your, and your contributions. Thank you all for coming to PowerShell Summit and, and giving us a reason to have this event. Um, this is the thing I look most forward to every year, so thank you. And pushing the button. <laughs>